Thank you very much, Ambassador Jazairi, and I'd like to thank the Geneva Center for uh, approaching us a few months ago um, to organize this event. I'd like to thank the permanent missions of uh, UAE and Azerbaijan for, for being here today, and the panelists in particular. I think that um, you've illustrated very well uh, some of the challenges involved in um, thinking about and dealing with internal displacement. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad uh, that this event is symbolic symbolically taking place uh, on the sidelines of the second consultations uh, on the Global Compact for Refugees that are happening upstairs because I think it's a good way to remind all of us out there debating what the uh, future international response to refugees and migrants should look like that um, there is a crucial part of the picture here that is missing and it's this part of the picture that, that we've been talking about today. So even though I think we need to focus on the issue of internal displacement as an issue in its own right, um, a good way to start this conversation is indeed by linking it uh, and embedding it into the broader displacement and migration uh, picture. We do need to acknowledge that uh, when we look at the hundreds of thousands of refugees and migrants who recently arrived in Europe, that the displacement journeys actually started somewhere else. And once we zoom out uh, of the picture, if we zoom out away from the ultimate points of arrival, we realize that there's a much bigger and potentially much more complex phenomenon that's unfolding here. Uh, and it's this, a phenomenon that um, paradoxically is receiving much less attention, as, as we've all said, on the international scene. Um, so at IDMC, we're convinced that uh, human mobility can't be fully understood without looking at what is happening inside countries' borders and without looking at this particular form of displacement. So I'm just going to be uh, walking you through perhaps a more global bird's eye view of the issue of internal displacement, so go, going beyond the examples of Syria, Iraq, and Azerbaijan, uh, and then touching a little bit on the so what question, why should we elevate this issue beyond a national issue on, on higher up on the international agenda. And then just maybe giving a few thoughts on what we see as the priorities uh, moving forward in the coming years when it comes to policy and, and action on internal displacement. Um, so as, be, as um, my colleagues have already mentioned in their presentations, um, I'd like to say first that the numbers already uh, speak for themselves. Today, the world does count over 40 million people internally displaced uh, by conflict and violence, which is indeed twice more conflict IDPs than refugees in the world. But in addition to people who are becoming internally displaced by conflict and violence, there are also huge numbers of people who become displaced every day by disasters that are brought on by natural hazards. Uh, like storms, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, we're looking at an average of 25 million people displaced every year since the, well, since we've started monitoring it, but uh, for, for, for the last few years. Um, we also know that there's a significant number of people who are becoming internally displaced each year by other, uh, other events, other triggers, other causes, such as major development and infrastructure projects, which often come with human rights violations, forced evictions. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that we actually understand much less. It goes largely unnoticed, and the numbers and the movements that come with those, uh, with those events are very hard to track. But nevertheless, we need to have that also on our radar screen when we're talking about internal displacement. So there's no denying that internal displacement is a very global phenomenon. Um, huge numbers of people were displaced in 2017 alone across the African continent, the Middle East, East Asia, the Pacific, South Asia, the Americas, Central Asia, and even Europe. Um, internal displacement isn't just happening in countries where you would most expect it to, those experiencing active or protracted conflict like the DRC, South Sudan, Nigeria, CAR, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, or even Ukraine. In 2017, and this is what we'll be reporting on uh, with our global report, which will be coming out uh, in May, in 2017, internal displacement also happened in places like the US and the Caribbean as a result of the Atlantic hurricane season, uh, in China, the Philippines, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, where storms and floods displaced millions throughout the year. We're looking at internal displacement happening in urban areas across the world where we can't even 
count the number of people who have become displaced. And we're also looking at displacement happening in contexts where a complex mix of environmental and political factors are causing people to gradually, but very sustainably over time, make that decision to flee as well. This was the case in 2017 in a country like Ethiopia, for example, where significant numbers were displaced by the drought that's been affected the, affecting the wider Horn of Africa region over the last few years. So internal displacement is widespread, um, but its causes and its patterns and its impacts are also very deeply rooted and very diverse. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint um, single causes uh, of these movements, uh, but as we know that in many contexts the causes are, are multiple. But what we do know is that internal displacement does take place predominantly in low and lower middle income countries. But we also know that higher income countries, particularly those exposed to uh, cyclical natural hazards, for example, are also, are also affected. We know that there's a correlation between internal displacement and poverty, state fragility, environmental change, urbanization. And it's obvious that those countries with the least capacity to cope are often the ones experiencing the severest levels of internal displacement and those where that displacement tends to become <coughs> protracted. In fact in, in fact, in many of the countries that we report on, the new displacements that are generated each year add to already existing caseloads of IDPs. And these displacement patterns across the world tend to become repeated, cyclical, and are rarely resolved within short time frames. We can only imagine the human suffering that this uprooting entails. Um, the physical, the psychological trauma of displacement uh, is particularly visible in some of the world's current humanitarian crises. We've discussed the, 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 the case in Syria right now where some of the most horrific stories are, are, are coming at us. But let's not also forget some of the big humanitarian crises across sub-Saharan Africa with the, with the DRC, South Sudan. Um, where IDPs are often primary targets of violence and where their physical safety is under threat on a daily basis. Uh, you may recall that um, early last year um, there were IDP camps in Nigeria that were being bombed by Boko Haram. So it's a very tragic illustration of how IDPs are often at the forefront of this, of this violence. Um, in many cases, the social impacts of children's schools being destroyed, families being separated, communities dislocated, and income-generating activities um, lost, all of these over time take a heavy toll. And in fact, if we project ourselves into the future, we need to start measuring the longer term, the cumulative impact of these, um, of these effects of internal displacement, the gradual human, social, economic, political losses that are suffered as a result of this displacement, they need to be measured because they have to be put forward as the key argument for why national governments and why the international community should invest more in preventing internal displacement from happening in the first place, but also finding lasting solutions to it. Um, one of the, the key arguments that we've made over the last um, few years in a desperate attempt uh, to refocus the world's attention to IDPs is precisely that leaving internal displacement unresolved is likely or can in some cases lead to spillover effects and cross-border movements. We've talked about it already. This has been the case in Syria, but also Nigeria, uh, Iraq, even as the special rapporteur said more recently in, in Libya. Um, so while we know that many of today's refugees and migrants are yesterday's internally displaced, it's also clear to us that today's IDPs, as we've said, could become tomorrow's refugees and migrants. Um, and conversely, refugees returning back to conditions of insecurity and instability in their countries of origin are also at risk of <coughs> becoming internally displaced again. Again, Syria being uh, a case in point right now. Um, so this is why we've been reminding policymakers involved in the shaping of the two global compacts that these connections need to be made and that more investment is needed to address the structural issues at the root of this displacement. We're calling for much more joined up and coordinated data systems, first of all, so that we can actually start tracking people across the entire displacement 
trajectory so that we can understand where they have come from and where they're going. But we're also calling for more comprehensive policy and operational responses. And as Rachel said, a much more sustained financial investment for a more sustained delivery of, a, of services that can cover that full continuum of displacement. Having said that, um, I would like to insist on the fact that um, beyond the consequences that internal displacement can have for wider migratory flows, we do need to acknowledge that the majority of IDPs in the world are likely to remain IDPs and won't have an option to cross an international border. Many of them will be forced to remain at home, or at least not in their original home, but in their home country. Um, so what kind of arguments can we, can we make there? How can we actually um, get more political attention on an issue that is essentially and quintessentially a national issue that requires first and foremost a national level response? We're commemorating this year 20 years of the UN Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. So at IDMC, we've been taking stock of what these 20 years have meant for the world's IDPs. And we've thought long and hard about what we'd like the next 20 years to look like and to focus on. Um, we do acknowledge that uh, progress has been made since 1998, not just in terms of normative developments with the adoption of a number of national uh, IDP or IDP-related laws and policies across the world, um, the ratification of the landmark Kampala Convention for the African continent, and various humanitarian reform processes that have tried to make operational responses in IDP context much more comprehensive, systematic, and predictable. Uh, globally, we also recognize that there's now um, a, a solid recognition that the issue of internal displacement is not just a humanitarian challenge, but needs to be treated as a fundamentally political and developmental one as well. Nevertheless, looking at the global picture, I think we need to ask ourselves what we can do better. And we need to ask ourselves what we want the next 20 years of the life of the guiding principles to, to, to bring about. Um, I've had to kind of reshape my, uh, my talking points listening to my fellow panelists. Um, because I think you came up with a lot of very important, uh, a lot of important points. One of the, the, the key issues, I think, that, that came up in both um, the, serious, the Syria case and the Azerbaijan case is that there is fundamentally, um, at the core of the issue, such a, such a strong political sensitivity attached to uh, internal displacement that we need to try and find a way of somehow getting around that political sensitivity. As Rachel said, first and foremost, national governments have to acknowledge that there's displacement taking place in their country. In certain contexts, perhaps in the Syrian one, uh, we're, we're not there yet. But in others, I think um, I have seen and I have experienced through a number of uh, conversations that, I have with, that I've had with national governments that there's uh, a, a very positive openness um, to acknowledging the issue and, and wanting to find solutions to it. And I think that's certainly a first step. But I think we mustn't be naive either. We also need to recognize that there are um, extreme political sensitivities attached to this, and they're always going to, to have to be taken into account as possible obstacles to finding solutions. So perhaps one way around it is to demonstrate that um, in order to, sorry, in order to uh, generate more political commitments to, to this issue, both at the national level and at the international level, is to demonstrate that there will be a long-term financial cost to not addressing internal displacement. We have shown, and I think, you know, I, I would hope that you would agree, we have shown that not resolving internal displacement and letting it linger for such long periods of time um, not enabling people to reintegrate, you know, after generations of displacement is going to take its toll, not just on, lo on individuals, on local communities, but also on national economies. So, first of all, I think if we can demonstrate that there's a cost in not doing anything, hopefully uh, we should get a little bit more um, political mobilization around the issue. Then I think that we need to also uh, call for a much more substantial investment, both um, financially and politically um, in both diplomatic and peace-building efforts, 
but also in reconstruction and longer term development. Um, I really commend the efforts of, uh, of Azerbaijan for having invested financially already so much into finding long term solutions, but I think the example also shows that more is needed. Um, and this is where I think the support of the international community has to be much more uh, prominent. Having said that, recognizing that internal displacement <coughs> is fundamentally a domestic issue, I think we need to ensure that it becomes embedded as an integral part of national governments' uh, national development plans. It has to be a part and parcel of national um, uh, poverty reduction strategies. Uh, in certain cases, it can be tied, particularly in, in, for Asian countries, it should be tied to national disaster risk reduction plans and strategies, climate change adaptation plans, whatever. But we need to find that entry point that can enable internal displacement to not be perceived as a, as a threatening or a, an isolated issue that is disconnected from ongoing priorities, but an integral part of these, of these priorities. So this, of course, does require international support, but um, and I'd like to end on that. It, it does require, for that international support to be mobilized, it does require that those countries that are directly experiencing internal displacement um, position themselves in the driving seat of future policy making on this issue. Um, I think there are a number of ways in which we can, we can bring a group of countries together <clears throat> Uh, to share experiences, to realize that there are commonalities, even maybe there are also commonalities between Nigeria and Vietnam. Who knows, there could be some interesting lessons to be learned there. But the, the important message is that national governments need to be uh, front and center of future policy making on this issue. They have been largely absent from international policy making on internal displacement, and it's time for that the entire narrative and the entire uh, political process around this issue to change. So at IDMC, we stand ready to support uh, governments in any way we can, um, and we hope that the next 20 years will bring about much more positive changes for IDPs across the world. Thank you.